welcome back dear students myself dr rakshesha we have started with chapter number 2 it's a sexual reproduction in flowering plant in this chapter we have finished two session and in the previous two sessions we have discussed a reproductive part of a plant that is flower we have discussed the different parts of a flower like calyx corolla androecium gynoecium the individual units like sepal petal stamen carpel that have been discussed here we have to discuss the sexual reproduction the events and processes so we have also started with a male reproductive part of a flower and that is a stamen we have seen the structure of a stamen what are the characteristic of a stamen we have also discussed the internal structure of a anther we have also seen the structure of microsporangium we discussed a process called as microsporogenesis means a process of formation of microspore or and we have seen few characteristics of pollen grain i just briefly revise what are the characteristic of a pollen grain and then we will go ahead with remaining characteristics of pollen grain okay students so let's start with a pollen grain i just briefly revise what are the different characteristics of a pollen grain pollen grain usually it is spherical in shape with a diameter of 25 to 50 micrometer apart from this spherical in shape there are also different shapes of a pollen grain and what are the different shapes of a pollen grain it may be oval it may be oblong or it may be a disk like etc these are the different shapes of a pollen grain if you see the surface of a pollen grain the surface of a pollen grain may be either smooth or spiny it looks like a particles of a dust usually it's a yellowish in color the cell wall of this pollen grain consists of two layers cell wall it consists of two layers the outer layer is called as axon the inner layer is called as internum axon is made up of organic material called as sporopollenin this is the most resistant material till they know it is resistant to organic acid also uh, strong acids strong bases and higher temperatures the entire the inner layer of cell wall it's made up of cellulose and pectin inside the wall there is a presence of cell membrane okay this cell membrane is surrounded to a cytoplasm so this is a structure of a pollen grain now if you see the structure of a pollen grain when it starts to grow up, it divides into two cells one larger cell the one smaller cell the larger cell is called as vegetative cell the smaller one it's called as germinative cell the larger cell vegetative cell it is full of rhizopod material and it has a irregular shaped nucleus the germinative cell it is a smaller one and that floats in the cytoplasm of a vegetative cell it has dense cytoplasm okay and a conspicuous nuclei is present into a germinative cell in 60% angiosperm the pollen grain is released at this stage but in remaining 40% stage the germinative cell again divides by a mitosis and it forms a three cell one vegetative cell and these two cells which are going to be produced they are called as male gametes each one is haploid in nature okay so this is a three cell condition male gametes and two male gametes and one vegetative cell so in remaining 40 percentage of the plant the pollen grain is released at three stage cell okay so either the pollen grain release might be at two cell stage or it may be released at a three cell stage we have finished this much now few characteristic of pollen grain that was remain so now let's discuss the other characteristic of a pollen grain
So what are the other characteristics of a pollen grain? Pollen grain might be causing allergy to an individual who are susceptible to it or who are affected by it. It may cause some respiratory disorders if it is continuously exposed. So the pollen grain it may has a chances to develop the respiratory disorders like asthma and it may develop a bronchitis. This may develop because they are smaller in size, 25 to 50 micrometer in size, they remain suspended in the atmosphere. When you inhale, the chances are that the pollen grain may go into your respiratory system and they may lead to a respiratory disorders like the asthma and the bronchitis or it may causes the chronic affliction to an energy like of a conditions that might be developed by this. How this occurs or which pollen grain are more susceptible to cause this kind of a respiratory disorders? The pollen grain which is obtained from a plant called as Partherium or Carrot grass. Clear the pollen grain of this plant Partherium or the Carrot grass that is highly susceptible to cause this respiratory disorders like asthma and the bronchitis. The pollen grain of this Partherium or the Carrot grass usually that is not originated from India but when we have imported a semi dwarf variety of a wheat from the United States along with that this pollen grain also came to India as a contaminant and now we have such a plants which releases this we have such plants now in India Partherium and the Carrot grass that releases the pollen grain in our atmosphere okay even if you see the environment prediction or the weather predictions of the western countries they also predict the amount of pollen grain in the atmosphere okay because they are highly allergic to such kind of a pollen grain but in india such kind of problem does not prevail much in our country okay so this is regarding to a disease which is caused by a pollen grain apart from that pollen grain they are rich in nutrients Nowadays it is a trend that many people are consuming this pollen grain. They believe that they are rich in nutrients such as that they give a more strength to a living organism. And nowadays the tablets, syrups of this pollen grains are also available in the western countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. This pollen grain is also going to be used by athletes or they can also be used by the horses in the race because it is believed that that increases the strength and the power of a it because it contains a or it is rich in nutrients third one the th next and the last characteristic of pollen grain that was remaining and the characteristic that was remaining is that the pollen grain which is causing a respiratory disorders the pollen grain that is rich in nutrient now what happens once the pollen grain is released Suppose this is an anther, anther and this is a filament. From that the pollen grain gets released. Now this pollen grain which is going to be released, that should fall onto a stigma. It should fall onto a stigma, the female reproductive part. Okay? Until it falls onto a stigma, it should remain a viable or it should remain or capable of living. So how much time this pollen grain is capable of living? So the viability of a pollen grain vary from a plant to a plant species. Like in case of a wheat, in case of a paddy plant, the viability of pollen grain is 30 minutes. Means after release of pollen grain from anther, it remains viable or it keeps living for 30 minutes. Okay. Next, in case of certain other plants, like the plant which is obtained from Rosaceae family. It is plant which is obtained from Solanaceae family. Okay, in these cases, this can also remain viable for several months. Okay, until it is viable, it can able to fertilize the ovule which is present or the female gamete which is present in the ovary. Okay, so it depends. The viability of a pollen grain depends from a plant to plant species. Like the wheat plant, paddy plant, the pollen grain of such plant that remains viable for 30 minutes, 
and the pollen grain of rosaceae, solanaceae family, they remains viable for several months. Now, can we preserve this pollen grain? Yes, we can also preserve the pollen grain. If you want to preserve a pollen grain, then you should keep this pollen grain in a liquid nitrogen. This liquid nitrogen, it will provide a temperature minus 190 degrees Celsius. Remember, minus 190 degrees Celsius. That temperature is provided with the use of a liquid nitrogen. And in such cold environment, this pollen grain can be preserved. Okay? This pollen grain can be utilized whenever it is necessary. And that can, from that, a fertilization process is proceeded. Okay? So thus, we can also preserve this liquid nitrogen. So the remaining characteristic, I just end this now. Pollen grain has a capacity to cause respiratory disorders like asthma and the bronchitis. Usually such kind of a diseases can be caused by the pollen grains of Parthenium and the carrot grass. The pollen grain of this plant was imported to India as a contaminant along with a wheat plant or semi dwarf variety of wheat plant. Pollen grains are rich in nutrient. Nowadays in the market, the tablets and syrups of pollen grain are available because it is believed that that causes a more, uh, that provides a more power and the strength. So that's why it can also be used by the athletes and the horse in the races. Next, the viability of this pollen grain. Once it is released from an anther or shed up from an anther, how much time it remains viable? It depends on the type of a plant species. In case of a wheat and a prairie plant, it can remain viable for 30 minutes. In case of plants of Rosaceae family and the Solanaceae family, it can remain viable for several months. You can also preserve this pollen grain at low temperature with the use of liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen provides a temperature of minus 190 degrees, 196 degrees Celsius. And that is acting as a pollen bank and that can be utilized wherever there is a necessity. So that's all about the characteristic of pollen grain. So we have discussed the structure of male reproductive part of a flower that is a stamen, anther, microsporangium and we also have discussed regarding the process called as microsporogenesis and the process of development of male gametes. Okay. Apart from that we have also seen the structure of a pollen grain and their characteristics. Okay. Now similarly we also have to learn the parts of a female reproductive part of a flower. The male reproductive part has been finished and we have discussed the how the male gamete is produced because in the pre-fertilization the first step is the formation of a gamete. So we have seen how the male gamete is produced within a pollen grain. Okay. Now we have to discuss how the female gametes are produced. Okay. And to learn that we have to learn the female reproductive part of a flower. Okay. So let's start with the female reproductive part of a flower. As you already know that I have repeated several times, androsium is main reproductive work of a flower. Similarly, the comparable organ of female reproductive part is a gynosium. So what is a gynosium? Gynosium is female reproductive work of a flower. It is a female reproductive work of a flower. The individual unit of gynosium, it can be called as carpel or it may be called as pistil. Okay. So what is another name of this? Uh, or carpel, the carpel is called as pistil. What is the individual unit of gynosium? The individual unit of gynosium is called as carpel or pistil. As you know that stamen can also be called as microsporophyll. What is another name of stamen? Microsporophyll. Similarly, the carpet or pistil can also be called as megasporophyll. Okay, what's another name of carpet or pistil? It's called as a megasporophyll. Okay. Now, this carpet or pistil is an individual unit of a gynosium. 
How many carpels are present in a plant? The number of carpels present in a gynoecium or the whorl or in a flower that may vary. If it possesses one carpel, the flower possesses one carpel, only one carpel. Such kind of flower is called as monocarpellary. Okay? If there are many carpels, then it's called as multicarpellary flower. Or it can also be called as polycarpellary flower. Clear? So based on the number of carpel, the flower can be divided. Okay, actually it is divided into three parts. If it possesses one carpel, then it's called as monocarpellary flower. If it possesses two flowers, then it's called as bicarpellary flower. And if it possesses many carpels, then it's called as multicarpellary or the polycarpellary flower. If there is a one carpel, then there is no problem of a fusion or the separations. But when there is a multicarpellary flower, the carpels may be fused, means they are attached with each other. Many carpels, they may be attached with each other or they may be free. If it is a fused or attached, this carpels makes a fused or attached, then it is called as syncarpus. And if it remains free, then it is called as apocarpus. Clear student? So what is a syncarpus? Syncarpus is a flower in which carpel is fused. And the apocarpus, apocarpus is a flower in which the carpel remains free. Okay? That is the case in case of multicarpellary or polycarpellary flower. Now let's discuss the different parts of a carpel. What are the different parts of a carpel or pistil? The carpel or pistil that's divided into three parts. The first is called as stigma. Second one is called as style. And the third one is called as ovary. What we have discussed in the first session, which are the different parts of a carpel or pistil. There are three parts of a carpel or pistil. Stigma, style, ovary. So let's start with the structure or I draw a structure of a carpel or pistil. The first part is a carp. Stigma. Second part, which is like a tube like. This tube like portion is called as style. And the last, a bulge portion, it's called as ovary. So this is a portion, what we call as stigma. Next, a tube like structure, what we call as style. And the lower one, bulge portion, it's called as ovary. I have drawn just a one carpet. This is a structure of one carpet. The stigma, that is a terminal part of a carpet or pistil. It serves as a landing platform of pollen grain. Pollen grain falls on it. It can accept. So that's why the structure of stigma is such a that it has a grooves. Within it grooves, that pollen grain might get uh, attached. Okay? Or that remains suspended within this groove. So that's why it has a groove-like structure. So it is, the stigma is serving as a landing platform for pollen grain, where the pollen grain falls. Okay. Next, the tube-like structure which is attached with it, it's called as a style. And the lower one, the bulge portion, it's called as an ovary. Okay. Now within an ovary, there is a cavity. This is a cavity. Okay. This is called as ovarian cavity. Or it can also be called as locule. Let's like say this is a cavity. Okay. Within that, there is a presence of a ovarian cavity, or there is a, or this ovarian cavity can also be called as locules. This ovarian cavity or the locules, it contains a presence of placenta. What it contains? Placenta. Okay. Such placenta is present, and from this placenta, the ovules are attached. So these are the ovules. Ovules are attached. Okay. Ovules are, this is an ovule that is attached to a placenta by a stalk. By a stalk that we will discuss. This ovule can also be called as megasporangium. What's another name of this ovule? It's called as megasporangium. I can repeat the structure of ovary. Ovary contains a cavity. This cavity is called as ovarian cavity. 
that contains a placenta. This is a placenta. Okay? The placenta that is attached with a ovule. Right? Ovule is also called as micro, um, sorry, megasporangium. Okay? The ovule is attached to a placenta by a stalk. Okay? That is a basic structure of carpet or pastry. Now, if you see the number of ovules, see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You know, I saw the 5 ovules. Okay? But it is not necessary, it is a 5, 2, 3, 1, etc. But the number of ovules within an ovary may vary. Some plants are such as that, or some fruits are such as that, that has just one ovule in a one flower. And there are also examples which has many ovules. Like the examples which has only one ovule. Like for example, mango. If you see a mango fruit, it has only one seed. Because you know that seed is formed from a ovule. Why it has only one seed? Because it has only one ovule. Okay? So this is a mango plant. It has only one ovule. Next, a wheel. Next, paddy. These are the examples in which the ovarian cavity possesses only one ovule and hence they only have a one seed. Now, there are also examples which have many ovules. Like for an example, papaya. Or you can see a second example, watermelon. Okay? These are the example. If you see a watermelon or the papaya, there are lots of seeds are present in this watermelon and the papaya. Why it has a lots of seeds? Because it has many ovules. Because you know that ovules are converted into a seed. Ovary, remember, ovary when it is fertilized, it converts into a fruit. Ovule when it is fertilized, it converts into a seed. So, when ovule gets fertilized, it leads to a conversion of seed. So, if it has many ovules, so how many seeds are produced? Many seeds are produced. If it has one ovule, how many seeds is produced? That is only a one seed is produced. So, these are the example in which there is only a presence of one ovule, like mango, wheat, paddy. But we also have examples which has many ovules and hence they have many seeds. Like for example, papaya and the watermelon, they have many ovules within an ovary. Okay? So, that is about a basic structure of a carpet or pistil. Okay? Now we have to, actually we have to see the process, what we call it as formation of female gamete. But for female gamete, we have to learn the structure. So, we have seen the structure of carpet, stigma, style, ovary. And ovary contains a ovule, what we call as megasporangium. So, now let, let's discuss the structure of megasporangium. Or we also call it as ovule. So now we start with a structure of ovule. What is another name of this ovule? Ovule can also be called as Megasporangium. Okay, before I start, I want to make you remember or remind you the different names. What is another name of stamen? Stamen is called as Microsporophyll. Okay, what is another name of carpet? The carpet is called as Megasporophyll. Okay, the stamen produces microspore. Okay, the carpet produces megaspore. Stamen contains microsporangium, usually circular in outline. Okay, that the structure of it, what we have discussed in the previous session. Now, this, this one that contains or the uh, carpel contains megasporangium, what we call it as ovule. Okay? Now we have to learn the structure of this ovule, or you can also call it as megasporangium. Okay? What is an ovule or what is a megasporangium? How it looks like? You know that this is an ovule. This ovule is attached with a stalk like portion to a placenta. That much information we we'll have now. Why we call it as ovule? Because usually it is oval in shape. Clear? That's why we are calling it as ovule. 
or the other name of this is called as mega storage unit. Okay. Now you know that this ovule, this is a ovule that is attached to a placenta by a stalk. So I will draw a stalk in an enlarged view. This is a stalk. Okay, by a stalk it is attached. Okay, so the stalk like portion by which it is attached to this is this is a placenta. Assume that this is a placenta. Okay, so this is a ovule. Ovule is attached to a placenta by a stalk. This stalk is called as funicle okay clear so what is a funicle the ovule is attached to a placenta by a stalk like portion this stalk like portion is called as funicle okay next this funicle attaches to a ovule at a certain part of a ovule this part a part of a ovule where the funicle attaches say this is a part of a ovule where the funicle attaches or the this portion is called as it's called as hilum what's called as it's called as hilum okay students so here it is ovule ovule is attached to a placenta by a stalk this stalk is called as funicle funicle is attached to ovule in a certain region of ovule the region where it attaches this is called as hilum okay now this ovule that is surrounded by two layers there is a presence of two layers okay that is surrounding to it the layers which is surrounding to ovule this is called as integuments clear what is called as integument but there are two layers the outer one is called as outer integument the inner one is called as inner integument okay so how many layers surrounding to an ovule so the ovules are surrounded by two layers the layers are called as integuments the outer one is called as outer integument the inner one is called as inner integument okay at a certain part where there is an integument is absent see this is a portion where the integument is absent covering is absent okay integument is the covering of a ovule that integument absent and this portion a pore like structure is formed a hole like structure is formed this is called as micropyle what's called as micropyle okay or you can also call it as apex of ovule or it is called as apex of ovule okay so what is a micropyle micropyle is a portion of a ovule where its covering is absent or the integument is absent this is called as micropyle okay now inside the covering this is the inner portion of a covering what it contains it is known as nucellus what it is called as nucellus the inner portion of this integument inside the integument or covering inside a covering what is present nucellus remember it's not a nucleus this is nucleus it is not a nucleus it is nucellus okay so it is a nucellus this nucellus is filled with reserve food material it's filled with a reserve food material and that is utilized by developing embryo cell or the female gametophyte okay so this is a nucellus now inside the nucellus there is a presence of embryo sac what it is embryo sac or you can also call it as female gametophyte okay pole and grain is male gametophyte similarly the embryo sac is female gametophyte okay so this is about a structure of this ovule okay one thing is left you know that there is a region where the covering is absent or integument is absent this is called as micropyle 
and that forms a apex of a ovule. It's opposite end. It's opposite. Opposite to this micropyle, this one. This is a end. This end is called as chalaza end. Or it's opposite base, which forms a base of ovule. Micropyle forms the apex. Its opposite is a chalaza. Chalaza forms a base. The opposite part of a micropyle is called as a chalaza. Okay. So the micropyle and the chalaza they are present in the opposite direction. Okay. So that's all about the structure of ovule or microsporangium. I again repeat, you have to remember it very clearly. Okay. So what is the structure of ovule or you can say a megasporangium? Ovule is called as megasporangium. Remember, usually ovule is oval in shape. This ovule is attached to a placenta. By a stalk, this is a stalk. This stalk is called as funicle. This funicle attaches to a ovule in a region of ovule. This region is called as hilum. Ovule is covered by a covering. How many covering? Two covering. One is outer integument. The another one is inner integument. Okay. But there is a place where there is a absence or there is no presence of covering or integument. This region is called as micropyle. This micropyle forms the apex of a ovule. Its opposite end of a micropyle is called as chalaza, which forms a base of a ovule. Inside the integument, there is a presence of nucellus. This nucellus is filled with a reserve food material, and that is provided to this embryo cell for its growth and development. Okay. Next. Inside the nucellus, there is a presence of embryo sac. Okay, so that is about the structure of megasporangium, or you can call it as ovule. This is an important part. Okay, so all of you should know the structure of this ovule or megasporangium. And inside this megasporangium, what we have? We have an embryo sac or female gametophyte. So now we have to learn how this female gametophyte is formed. And that is by a process. By which process it is going to form? So let this let's discuss the process by which it is going to form, or how the female gametophyte develops. Megasporogenesis. Megasporogenesis. You already know the meaning of genesis. Now I don't have to tell you what is the meaning of genesis. Genesis means a formation. Formation of what? Megaspore. The formation of megaspore is called as megasporogenesis process. Okay. So here a megaspore is formed, and this megaspore is finally developed into a female gametophyte, or what we call it as embryo sac. Okay. How it occurs? Let me will see. But before that, we have to see the formation of megaspore. Because once the megaspore is formed, then the female gametophyte or embryo sac is formed. Okay. So first, we will learn a process called as megasporogenesis. So what is a megasporogenesis? It is a process of formation of a megaspore from megaspore mother cell. What we call it as MMC. Shortly called as MMC. Megaspore mother. cell okay so a formation of megaspore from megaspore mother cell this process is called as megasporogenesis this megaspore formation can be achieved by a process called as meiosis which process meiosis okay so let's see This is a megaspore mother cell. So I draw just a megaspore mother cell. This is a megaspore mother cell. It is a diploid in nature, means it it contains a two n number of chromosome. It divides by which process? Meiosis. So you know that meiosis forms how many daughter cells? Four daughter cell because it's a characteristic of a meiosis. Okay, and you know that at the end of meiosis process. 
the daughter cell which has generated that contains haploid number of chromosome or you can say that n number of chromosome and this is what it is going to be formed these are called as megaspores okay so simple one it's a process of formation of megaspore from megaspore mother cell how it occurs a diploid megaspore mother cell remember what's a ploidy of megaspore mother cell it is a 2n diploid it undergo which process meiosis and it generates how many four haploid means n contain megaspore this process is called as megasporogenesis okay so one megaspore mother cell generates how many megaspores four megaspore is produced this is called as megasporogenesis clear students so this process is called as megasporogenesis now what happens to this megaspore and how the embryo sac or female gametophyte gets developed so let's move ahead so i briefly just enumerate this is a 2n megaspore mother cell it divides by process called as meiosis how many megaspore are formed yes four megaspores are formed each contains how many number of chromosome half the number of chromosome than the parent cell because it's a meiosis process these all are megaspores so one megaspore mother cell generates four haploid megaspores now what happens to this or how the further process occurs now you know that four haploid megaspores are produced from one diploid megaspore mother cell from this four okay three will degenerate okay that means they gets destroyed from four how many gets degenerated three gets degenerated only one gets left okay so i just keep over here this is a megaspore once after destroying whatever the megaspore that is left any one gets left because all are equal okay this is called as functional megaspore okay so what uh, what happens to this four megaspore from the four megaspores what is that is generated from megaspore mother cell three will degenerate when the development starts only one gets remain any one gets remain and the one that is remain that is called as megaspore or we can also call it as functional megaspore from this functional megaspore the embryo sac develops but only from one functional megaspore the embryo sac development happens so such kind of development is called as monosporic development okay so what is a monosporic mono means a one development of embryo sac from only one functional megaspore this is called as monosporic development okay now you know that this is a functional megaspore what happens to it this functional megaspore the nucleus which is present in it this is the nucleus which is present in it okay this is a cell functional megaspore it contains a nucleus nucleus contains a n number of chromosomes okay now they divides mitosis they divides by a process called as mitosis okay mitosis means how many daughter cells are produced two daughter cells are produced so it divides by mitosis by i just draw a nucleus okay it divides by mitosis and how many daughter cells are produced two that again go under a mitosis okay that again undergo mitosis So this is a mitosis. 
This is again a mitosis. Mitosis. Okay. Every time two daughter cell is produced because it's a mitosis process. And as it is a mitosis, it contains the same number of chromosomes as the parent. Parent has an end, so obviously all contains a n number of chromosomes. Only in meiosis, the chromosome number gets half. In mitosis, the chromosome number remains the same. So the functional megaspore is formed. How it is formed? You know that. Three will degenerate, only one gets left. That is called as functional megaspore. This functional megaspore, they enters into a meiosis or they divide by a meiosis. Sorry, mitosis. Okay? How many times it undergo mitosis? It undergo mitosis three times. One, two, three times successively. So when it enters a mitosis first time, two nuclei are formed. Second time, total four nuclei are formed. And when third time, total eight nuclei are formed. Remember, this functional megaspore now enters into a mitosis three times successively. And at the end, how many nuclei gets formed? Eight nuclei gets formed. How many nuclei gets formed? Eight nuclei gets formed. I just draw eight nuclei over here. These are the eight nuclei is going to be formed because the process occurs over here. Okay? And then ultimately embryo cell formation occurs. Okay? Now this eight nuclei gets formed. See, this is a kind of a mitosis. Usually a mitosis. In mitosis, first a nuclear division occurs, means nucleus gets divided, and then what divides? Cytoplasm divided. But here the mitosis what occurs? That is free nuclear mitosis. What is a free nuclear mitosis? Free nuclear mitosis means it is a type of mitosis where nucleus divides, but the cytoplasm does not divide after a division of a nucleus. So only nucleus divides, only nucleus gets divided. Cytoplasm does not divide. So how many nuclei came into existence? Eight nuclei came into existence after a three time successful division. Okay? Now what happens? These eight are over there. Now you know the end. This end. The end towards the micropyle is called as micropyle end. The end towards the chalaza, this is called as chalaza end. This nuclei gets organized. Remember, each one has a haploid number of chromosome, but I don't have a space over here to write. So I just organize. Three nuclei are arranged at micropylar end. Three will arrange at chalazal end. And the two nuclei, it remains in the center. Okay? I again repeat, from eight, this eight nuclei which is going to be formed, three will be arranged at micropylar end. 3 will be arranged at chalazal end and the 2 will be inside the total 8 finish. So 8 nuclei comes into existence. Now it becomes a mature. This nuclei develops a cell membrane around it. Okay? It develops a cell membrane around it. Okay? So now what happens? This 3 nuclei or 3 cells, these 3 cells and these 2 nuclei, they combine together. So N plus N combines together form 2N and these are all our N. Right? So you can come to know. It's very difficult to observe, but they are all our haploid. Okay? So three cells are present at the microbiota, three cells are present at the chalazana, and the two cells which work in the center. Now it combines. Remember, here there are two nuclei. N, N. Now they combine during the development. N plus N, they combine together and form a 2N. Okay? So at the maturity, how many cells? 8 cells. 3 plus 3, 6. 6 plus 1, 7. Now 8 cell converts into a 7 cells. Okay? And here the two nuclei gets converted. So this condition is called as 8 nucleate but how many cells? Seven cells. Okay? How this process occurs, I can repeat. Initially, it has, we have eight nuclei. How we have eight nuclei? Eight nuclei which is formed at the end of three mitosis for functional megaspore. From this eight nuclei, three arrange at micropylar end, 
three are three are arranged at channels and two remains in the center. Okay, so total eight nuclei. This nuclei converts into a cell. Okay, but during that means during the maturation process. During the maturation process, the two nuclei which is present in the center they fuse together, and now it becomes only one. So each one contains an n. Now by fusing it becomes a two n. Okay. So here it's a seven cell. Three plus three, six plus one, seven. And how many nuclei? Eight. Three, three, and here two gets fused. So eight nuclei. So this condition is called as eight nuclei and seven cell. This is very important, okay, regarding the examination point of view. And they are usually asked at the maturation how many nuclei? Eight nuclei. But how many cells? Seven cells are going to be produced. Which seven cells? What are their names? You know that three cells are at the micropylar end. Three cells are at the center, and the two or they fused in the center. Okay, the three which is at the micropylar end. What are the the three which is present at the micropylar end? From that one is egg cell. One remember one egg cell, and these two are. Synergy cell. All of you know that how many nuclei are present at the micropylar end? Three nuclei or three cells are present. From three cell, which three cell? One egg cell and two synergy cell, which combines together and it form egg apparatus. What it forms? Egg apparatus. Egg apparatus is present at which end? Egg apparatus is present at the micropylar end. What the egg apparatus contains? Egg apparatus contains one egg cell, means one female gamete. Okay, and two synergy cell. Total three. Okay, this is most important question. I again repeat, what the egg apparatus contains? Egg apparatus contains one egg cell and two synergy cell that is present at which end? Micropylar end. Now the three cells which is present at the chalazal end. This all three cells. Which is present at the chalazal end, they are called as antipodal cells. So, what is antipodal cells? The antipodal cells they are present at the which end? They are present at the chalazal end, a base. And in the center, what is present? This is the center that is present is called as polar nuclear. It's a polar nuclear. Okay, I again repeat at the micropylar end. Egg apparatus is present that contains one egg cell to synergy cell. Second, at the chalazal end, how many cells are present? Three. All these three cells are called as antipodal cell. In the center, the two nuclei combine together and they are considered as polar nuclei. And thus, there is a formation of embryo cell or female gametophyte occurs. So. That's all about how the female gamete or egg cell gets produced. Egg cell means a female gamete or embryo cell formation takes place. Okay. So in the previous session we have seen how male gamete is produced. In this session we have seen that how female gamete is produced. You already know that gametes are haploid. So male gamete produces haploid. Female gamete also produced over here is a haploid. Okay. But how many male gametes are produced? Two male gametes are produced. And how many female gamete is produced? One female gamete is produced. Remember this information because we have to apply this in the next during the fertilization process. So today we end here. We have finished with a first process in pre-fertilization. It is gamete formation, gametogenesis. Male gamete is already formed in the previous session. We have formed it, and in this session we have learned how the female gamete is formed. The gametogenesis is formed. Now the second step in pre-fertilization, and that is gamete transfer. Gamete is formed. Male gamete is formed in the stamen. Female gamete is formed in the cartilage. Now the male gamete has to be transferred because usually male gamete is motile and female gamete is stationary. It has to be transferred. But here it's an angiosperm. Both are non-motile. Okay. Even pollen grain or you can say male gamete cannot move. The male gamete is present in pollen grain. Female gamete can also not move, so there is a need of agent which will transfer a male gamete to a female gamete, and that what we call as pollinating agent. 
so in the next session we will learn the pollination process which how the transfer occurs what are the different ways of transport uh, gamete transfer okay and who will helping in that transfer process or gamete transfer process means uh, you can say that which agents they will help in that process what we call it as pollinating agents so that's all about it today's session we end it over here today's session thank you for watching keep learning subscribe this channel and thank you for watching again just have a look for few time